Good afternoon, good evening, wherever you're turning in from. My name is Kathy Molig. She, her, her are my pronouns. I am the executive director and founder of Trans Family Support Services. We're very excited to be able to provide this program for you today on trans femme surgeries with Dr. Thomas Satterwhite. Uh, just a little bit about us first, Trans Family Support Services. Our tagline is navigation for the journey. So we're here to provide whatever means uh, are necessary to help trans folks to thrive in their lives. Our focus is on youth and their families, but we are here to serve in whatever way we can. Uh, one of the, the biggest pieces is this medical and insurance navigation that we offer assistance for in giving referrals for, for doctors and uh, different clinics, as well as working with individuals to make sure that insurance is covering for all of your medical needs. So if we can be of service, we're here, we're ready to, to help and to reach out. And I, I'm so excited to get to introduce Dr. Thomas Satterwhite today. Uh, Dr. Satterwhite has been committed to serving the trans population for over seven years. I personally have sent many of our clients to him. They've been very, very happy with their treatment and their results. And today we're going to get a, a whole lot of information about those trans femme surgeries and, and a little bit more about Dr. Satterwhite. So without further ado, it's nice to see you, doctor. Hi, Kathy. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, uh, that introduction. Um, and, you know, I, I am certainly, you know, delighted. It's an absolute pleasure and an honor to be here tonight. Um, and it is an ambitious goal of mine to go through all of the different surgical options um, for trans feminine and non-binary and gender diverse um, individuals. I do believe I have about 300 slides. I will go through them <laughs> quickly and efficiently. And I wanna make sure that, you know, questions are appropriately um, answered. So my plan is to go through the questions or to go through the slides in about 45 minutes and then leave the time afterwards to go through um, uh, questions that are brought up by the uh, by the audience. Um, Excellent. This, we have a we have a few questions, and those of you that are tuning in live, you can feel free to throw your questions um, on, and we will get to as many as we can in the time that we have together. So, with that, we'll turn it over to you, Dr. Satterwhite. Thank you. Great, and so once again, I, I do wanna go through all the different trans feminine surgical options covering vaginoplasty, facial feminization, um, breast augmentation, and body uh, contouring. Uh, just a little bit about myself. I did my training at Stanford uh, Medical School, plastic surgery, um, well, college medical school, and then my plastic surgery um, residency. And then I subsequently spent a year in Miami uh, doing my craniofacial training. This is a picture of my husband, Harold, and her, her uh, son, who was a baby um, at that point. I subsequently came back um, to the Bay Area um, in 2014. I was with another uh, practice at that point, and then subsequently created my own practice um, in 2018 uh, called Align Surgical Associates. And to my left is Dr. Angela Rodriguez, who joined us recently. And then to my right is Dr. Dave Gurjala. Uh, who has been with me uh, since uh, 2019. And among all three of us, we perform all aspects of gender affirming uh, surgery and our practice is devoted 100% to gender surgery. So what are the reasons uh, for moving forward with gender surgery? And every patient is gonna be unique, but in general, it's for the treatment of gender dysphoria, for achieving congruency and attaining positive physical, social, emotional, and psychological well-being. And then for many patients, engaging in meaningful uh, relationships is an important component. So why plastic surgery? And I think a lot of us may have an association with the plastic surgeon being you know, related to cosmetic surgery, but I think it's important for all of us to understand, I think we all do, that this is indeed reconstructive surgery that we are uh, moving forward with. And it's derived from the Greek word plastike, which means to shape or to mold. What's really important is to be empowered. Do your research, ask lots of questions, find a surgeon you trust. And I never feel offended if a patient um, or a family doesn't want to move forward with me by any means. Uh, you certainly do have you know, choices and options out there, probably not as much as there should be, 
uh, from other, um, you know, considering all the different types of medical uh, treatments that are out there. Um, but there are options and you should explore them. You're in control, you have a choice and you certainly deserve the best. Um, as you're getting started on your journey, and it is important to think of this as a journey, okay? Um, everything they have to do to prepare for the operation and then everything that's expected post-operatively. It's not just the operation itself, it's everything that's surrounding the operation that you wanna keep in mind. So be informed, know what to expect. Um, acceptance is important, personal acceptance, acceptance from your family, from your community, and then connect with as many people as you can, patients, other family support groups. Um, and it is a long multi-step process. It's not instantaneous. As I said, there are multiple surgical options, so a whole host of trans-feminine surgical options, and then also trans-masculine uh, surgical options uh, that my surgical associate, Dr. Uh, Dave Gorjala, had talked about last week. Um, and not every patient moves forward with every single one of these surgical options. Once again, it's about what brings on the dysphoria for that particular individual, and that can change over time. You know, initially I may have patients who come in asking for a vaginoplasty, but as we continue our treatment process, they start considering other options later down the line. And then certainly I have patients who come in who are interested in all aspects of gender surgery. The process of transitioning is different for everyone. So it can be referred to as, you know, coming out initially, seeking therapy, living as your desired gender, hormone therapy, and then surgery. So once again, this is a simplistic way of looking at it because there are certainly patients and individuals who do not follow this, um, you know, quote unquote, stepwise process and everyone's gonna be individual. And there's certainly individuals and patients who do not pursue hormone therapy. We do follow standards of care um, as established by the World Professional Association of Transgender Health. And the diagnosis is based on DSM-5 criteria. So typically using the ICD code F64.0 from an insurance standpoint. Multidisciplinary care is, is certainly important. And for me, as a plastic surgeon, I think of myself as kind of the caboose and the train that's involved in the care um, of transgender, uh, non-binary and gender diverse individuals. The mental health professional has a very important role and I do rely on their expertise as we move forward with the treatment of the patient, both preoperatively and postoperatively. And I think what's important is also looking at other associated mental health concerns that might be um, related um, to the patient's um, you know, upbringing, life, and it's not unusual to have anxiety and depression to be associated um, uh, in one's uh, uh, psychosocial history. So I think it's really important to optimize uh, mental health um, as any patient moves forward with gender-affirming surgery. And now that I think about it, I think it's important for any patient to have optimization of their mental health as they move forward with any type of operation or any stressful event in life. And I think the more that you're optimized, the better you're going to have um, in terms of uh, dealing uh, with issues that might come up post-procedures. Uh, post so starting with vaginoplasty, there are three different types of surgical options. So penile inversion vaginoplasty, which I'll talk, uh, talk about, this is referred to at this point in time as the, the gold standard for gender affirming um, uh, uh, vaginoplasty. Uh, peritoneum and bowel uh, can be pursued. I'll touch upon these um, towards, uh, towards the end. Um, they are important discussions and we are starting to see peritoneum being brought up more and more. And just briefly, peritoneum is the lining of the inside of the, of the abdomen. And there are also patients who do pursue uh, full vaginoplasty, but also inquire about minimal depth vaginoplasty or vulvoplasty, so not um, moving forward with a vaginal canal. And then also phallus preserving vaginoplasty, so patients who um, are not necessarily dysphoric over having their current genitalia, so having um, a phallus, but feel that to uh, fully fulfill their gender identity and gender expression do need a vagina. And there are some patients who pursue nullification where it's removal of their current uh, genitalia, but have no desire uh, to have the addition of other uh, types of uh, uh, genital reconstruction. I won't go into details about those. Certainly we can bring that up in the discussion if we have time, but I'm gonna focus on full vaginoplasty. Uh, patients who may not be good candidates or those who've had history of trauma, radiation, who may not have, who, who may not have completely realistic expectations, a uh, lack of compliance or poor social support. So what I oftentimes ask my patients is to look on my website, look at my results, and if none of the results they see on my website are appealing to them or something that they feel they can live with, then moving forward with a vaginoplasty would not be in their best interest. I find that having poor social support is actually gonna be the biggest um, indicator for having a poor outcome 
postoperatively. Two mental health uh, letters are needed, one from a doctorate level. And then, um, uh, and this is, um, these are guidelines that are certainly um, set in place by uh, the World Professional Association of, Stan uh, of Transgender Health. And this certainly may change over time, but currently from an insurance standpoint, two mental health um, letters are needed in order to get appropriate coverage. Uh, just like with any surgical procedure, um, we do need to have a thorough history and physical. So I'm certainly looking for anything in your medical history or your social history that can contribute to poor outcomes of poor wound healing, bleeding, infection. Um, so I'll look through all of your medications, smoking, we want to hold off on any nicotine products. Patients and individuals have asked about their uh, BMI, so the body mass index. There's, this is basically an indicator of your weight or your obesity. So it looks at your height and your weight and comes up uh, with a number um, using a special formula. So if it's above 35, uh, that's an indicator of morbid obesity. I typically tell my patients that you need to hold off and we need to get your weight lower before you move forward. And the reason why is because studies and studies that I have uh, I've done myself have shown that if you have a body mass index above 35, you will have a high chance, pretty much 100% chance of uh, having wound healing issues. In terms of age, the minimum age that I uh, move forward with vaginoplasty is 17. Maximum age, there isn't one as long as you're healthy. And then my, my office, and most offices, and most surgeons who do uh, gender-affirming surgery have a dedicated staff that really uh, will help with the appropriate insurance coverage. Safe housing is super important. Um, I look for all of my patients, what I really, really focus on is ensuring that they're supported by friends and family and that they have a reliable relationship with a mental health professional. These are the two things that I find will be the best indicator of how a patient will do postoperatively. There are multiple insurance companies that we do work with that we're in network with. Um, and I find that uh, the coverage is oftentimes dependent on the employer um, and unfortunately the state where the policy is based. And we're fortunate that at least in California um, and then many states on the East Coast as well, um, coverage can be quite uh, reliable, but unfortunately it can be variable. So the process, I just wanted to lay this out here to show how confusing this process can be. And I'm in the, in the midst of it and I find it you know, confusing. Uh, but this is this basically shows that if an op an operation is authorized, we move forward. But if it's denied, there are lots of different things that we may have to go through in terms of appealing, um, and oftentimes bringing uh, legal action um, involved. It's an unfortunate um, aspect of getting coverage for gender affirming surgery. But unfortunately, this is a world that we live in. But once again, more and more, we are getting appropriate coverage for all aspects of gender surgery. I'm just showing this diagram. And we show this to all of our patients. So someone who's moving forward with vaginoplasty really needs to start the process of hair removal about a year beforehand. So removing hair from the scrotum, from the perineum, which is basically the um, area between the scrotum, um, and the anus and any hair that happens to be on the base of the shaft. It can take about a year, either electrolysis or um, laser hair removal can be done and they're both quite effective. And uh, one thing that I wanted to point out is that I'm a big fan of research. And so I've done an extensive amount of research over the past seven years, um, particularly with um, you know post-operative um, outcomes. Um, one thing that I looked at was the use of uh, hormones perioperatively. And what we found is that um, stopping hormones can many times lead to a lot of negative um, emotional responses and make compliance with postoperative care difficult. So for the past two years, I've actually allowed patients to maintain their feminizing hormones uh, around the time of the operation. I've, I've found that's really helped a lot uh, with their psychological well-being. And many surgeons throughout the United States do the same as well. Um, the ideal vagina should be natural, convincing, uh, minimal upkeep, um, engaging in sexual intercourse if you choose to do so, erogenous, and um, have lubrication. Right now, the penile inversion vaginoplasty does not um, allow for um, lubrication. Uh, these are the aspects um, of the uh, vagina um, that are typically um, going to be uh, created. Um, I'm not going to go into um, the anatomical aspects right now, but just really briefly, um, so the first aspect of the operation is removing the current gonads, so the masculine gonad, gonads, the, the testicles is what's referred to as the orchiectomy. The second aspect um, in this diagrammatic rep representation is actually removing um, the shaft skin and preserving that, okay? 
that's going to be the lining of the vagina. The next step is actually removing the tip of the penis, the glands, and maintaining the nerve and the blood supply. The next step, um, and once again, it's pretty simplified, is short, uh, shortening the urethra and then removing all of the erectile tissue since it won't be needed. Okay. And then from there, the next step is actually going to be creating the clitoris itself, a source of, it's going to be an erogenous organ. Uh, so making it smaller and then placing it in the correct anatomic location on the pelvis. And as we move forward, I use the skin from the shaft and it's not shown here in this diagram, but I actually suture, um, attach the scrotal skin that I've removed as a skin graft to that. And then both the shaft skin and the scrotal skin are placed into the pelvis to line the inside of the vagina. And then you can see the urethra and the clitoris, which are inset. And the whole process actually takes about three to four hours. Once again, this diagrammatic representation was, you know, one minute, not true, but um, it's about a four hour process. And I just wanted to cycle through some pictures here. Here's an immediate post-operative result uh, that you can see here. Um, another immediate post-operative uh, result. Um, I use this uh, a, a device, it's called a wound vac over the area. I've started, I've actually been using this over the past year and a half to two years, and it really helps reduce swelling um, and bruising over the area. And so now these are longer uh, results, so one year results, and you can see how um, the incision line um, goes away. So in the initial pictures that I showed you, you saw the you know pretty prominent incision line, but over time it does go away. And every vagina is gonna be different. And I show these to all of my patients to let them know that there's always gonna be variability um, in vaginas and achieving um, you know, a specific result can oftentimes be difficult if not impossible. So post-operatively, patients stay with us for about two days. Um, after they go home, um, after about a week, they return to our clinic. We take out the packing, the catheter, um, and then we have them return to clinic every week uh, for another uh, two weeks, and then every three months after that. Uh, one thing that we've been uh, doing with our patients is actually hyperbaric oxygen treatment, um, and this is a way of actually helping uh, to promote um, uh, wound healing postoperatively. Um, I can discuss that more in the uh, towards the end if we do have time, but I found that that's had great results in terms of reducing swelling, inflammation, and wound healing problems. Taking care of the neovagina is important. So patient compliance, having social support, wound care, regular dilation, regular uh, douching are very important postoperatively. And yes, it is lifelong dilation. By the time you get to when you're post-op, you do need to be dilating. Um, you, you're only going to be dilating maybe once, uh, once a week. If you're engaging, and sexual, penetrating sexual intercourse, and you're doing that at least once a week, then that can count as dilation. And I tell that most of my patients by three months post-op, you're gonna feel close to baseline. It really does take about three months to really get back to where you need to be both psychologically, emotionally, and then also physically. So recovery is a long process. So it's important to understand that. From um, a research standpoint, I know this was brought up by, by someone as a, as a question in terms of like levels of, of satisfaction. So I uh, studied my own patients. Uh, this was a paper that was published a few years ago. And I looked at my first uh, 117 patients when I first started out. Um, and what I found is the majority of patients were healthy. 41% um, of patients did have some type of mental health disease, not surprising given the um, level of you know, trauma uh, that many of our patients unfortunately have, have gone through in life. Um, but what are the post-operative complications? So the biggest thing that patients develop is granulation tissue, and I'll show some pictures of that. So about 25% of patients do develop that. Um, and then major complications, so having some degree of wound breakdown or necrosis um, can happen in about 17% of patients. Um, other things that could potentially happen, so rectovaginal fistula, that's where you get a hole that connects the rectum to the vagina. Initially in these results, it was at 1.7%. Now after seven years, it's down to 0.4%. So not a very common uh, thing that happens. So granulation tissue, and I, when I show these pictures to patients so they understand what potentially um, this looks like. It's kind of this beefy red tissue that loves to form in the vagina. Typically treat it with topical medications like silver nitrate or metahoney. Vaginal tightness and difficulty dilating can happen with some patients. So increasing dilation, pelvic therapy has been a godsend and I do refer many of our patients to pelvic therapy. Um, and then for patients where conservative uh, measures don't help, we move on to surgery, which is rare. Vaginal odor, good hygiene, 
um, boric acid suppositories, um, antibiotics if you do develop vaginosis, vaginal drainage expected. So this is going to happen for the first three to six months, and there's always going to be some de degree of drainage for the rest of um, your life. So regular douching, um, good hygiene is going to be important. Infection cellulite is pretty rare, um, and this usually happens within the first month. We treat it with antibiotics. Urinary tract infections. Um, now that you have a vagina or any patient who has a vagina, there is going to be a higher rate of urinary tract infections. That's just unfortunately the the I suppose the fate of having a vagina. So good hygiene, maintaining good hydration, and then yeast infections. Once again, a higher chance of getting yeast infections. So good hygiene, avoiding synthetic materials, um, but can typically be easily uh, treated. And for patients who have difficulty orgasming, there are lots of different things that we can help uh, to ensure um, that you can get there. Most patients are able to orgasm by about three months, but many patients might take until about a year, sometimes even two years. Sexologists, there are many throughout the area um, and throughout the country who are very good and skilled um, at helping patients um, achieve orgasms. Prolonged pain and swelling, I think it's a lot of it is time, anti-inflammatory medications and pelvic therapy. Bleeding tends to be pretty rare, but this is oftentimes treated with just compression to the area. Um, and it, at this point in time, I would say about 1% of patients have a, a chance of needing to go back to the operating room because of prolonged bleeding. But bleeding and spotting can happen postoperatively, can happen up until about three months. Once again, direct pressure to the area, and that'll stop it. So wound breakdown and necrosis happens in a good number of patients. I said about 17% of patients, and then typically treating it with local wound care. So this is an example. So I should have warned everyone. So here's more of a graphic picture that I wanted to show. So this is a patient at two weeks post-op, same patient at six months, and she looks wonderful. And then here's another uh, sorry, graphic picture here uh, of someone who had a significant degree of wound breakdown. She had a history of obesity and diabetes. And then just with wound care, she healed wonderfully. And then post-operative blues, mental distress can happen. So frequent check-ins, tapering off opioids, maintaining hormone use perioperatively has helped tremendously. And then I found that having appropriate family dynamics is so important. And what I want to emphasize to you know anyone who's in the audience, um, parents, guardians, any providers, I think it's really important to be honest with me and any surgeon and any of your healthcare providers, if family dynamics are not where they need to be, please be honest, bring that up, make sure that you have a healthy family environment before moving forward, uh, because it can be stressful postoperatively. And if it's not healthy preoperatively, the stress of the operation can significantly affect it. And then frequent visits with the mental health providers and then lots of um, reassurance. Uh, vaginoplasty revisions can happen. Um, I just quickly wanted to go through this. So about 20% of patients do need some type of revision postoperatively. And these are kind of some extreme examples. So this is actually one of my patients didn't obviously didn't have the best results. So we did a more formal labiaplasty. There's always some degree of unpredictability in wound healing. And so revisions can happen, which we typically wait until about you know a year. Fat grafting can be done as well. Some patients have loss of fat, and so then we can come back and fat graft. And patients are happy. So looking at my patients, 94% of them feel positively, 75% are satisfied with sexual function, 77% are able to orgasm, and 72% say their orgasm is better now compared to before, and 71% say their gender dysphoria is resolved. Um, the reason why it's not higher is because they may have other operations that they may be pursuing or other aspects of their life that they have to work on. And then 93% would do this operation again, and 94% are happier now after their operation. I think issues that can affect patient satisfaction or developing a complication, history of physical abuse or history of suicide attempt. And that's not surprising. That doesn't mean that if someone has a history of physical abuse or history of suicide attempt that they're not a good surgical candidate. It just means that they need to be appropriately counseled and need to have appropriate support as they move forward, and that's it. Um, and then just quickly going through here, so this was a, a, um, a text that someone sent me at close to 10 o'clock at night. Uh, Dr. Satterway, thanks for my surgery. You've been, um, I've been able to have uh, four orgasms. Your work is wonderful. And so just talking about peritoneum, so this, was a, a, this is a group in New York. So NYU was pretty big. New York University is pretty big on doing peritoneum. My good friend, Dr. Heidi Wittenberg here in San Francisco, and then uh, uh, colleagues and friends um, at Oregon Health State University uh, use this procedure, but it's basically taking a lining. 
So this is the bladder, this is the, the rectum. So the lining of the abdomen referred to as the peritoneum. So they kind of fold that over to form the vagina. This has you know, been uh, kind of a popular procedure over the past three years. The advantages are that it can be used when there's limited gen genital tissue. So someone who's been on blockers, um, someone who, or someone who may have had a penile inversion vaginoplasty um, and needs to have a revision. I think those are the, the indications, but the disadvantages are that you need to have a high level of expertise in robotic laparoscopic procedures. Okay, so this is really high level surgeon, uh, surgery. So very few surgeons can do that. And the potential for complications within the belly or the abdomen. So damaging the colon or the small bowel bladder injury. Um, and the thing is you still need lifelong dilation and self lubrication is actually pretty limited. Um, colon can be done, um, used as well. This is a paper that I wrote when I was at Stanford. So taking a small portion of the colon and using that to create the vagina, it's not a terribly popular operation. Once again, it's used when there's limited genital tissue available. And I think this is a good backup if you've had penile inversion, vaginoplasty, and peritoneum, and they've both failed. And I think the third line would be uh, the colon. The disadvantage, drainage, which is referred to as mucorrhea, malodor or bad odor, um, inflammation, intra-abdominal complications, and need for long-term cancer screening, um, unfortunately, are going to be um, issues. And with that, ooh, so I spent a lot of time on vaginoplasty, so I'm just going to quickly go through the other uh, procedures here. So facial gender um, affirming surgery. Um, so what we all want to keep in mind is that your face is the window to the world. It only takes um, uh, all of us a fraction of a second to look at your face, to look at anyone's face, and our minds will um, make the determination as to whether or not it's a masculine or a feminine face. And this was based on an, an eye gaze study that I had done with uh, Stanford and the, and the facial team. And the brow, so the forehead, the jaw, and the chin are the areas that really stand out. And so I think, you know, many of us can look at a face and deem it feminine or masculine and kind of like classical things that we look for are a brow ridge, a larger nose, a bigger chin jaw, which you deem it, um, you know, masculine. And then of course the Adam's apple. And um, just really quickly, and so what's really important when I assess a patient is their goals and wishes, the bottom here. So I can certainly go through a facial analysis, talk about different things that I could do. I never do that. I always ask my patients, what are your specific goals and wishes? Um, I do get x-rays beforehand, and I do find it helpful for patients for me to provide ideal images of you know, the face that they're looking for. And I think the majority of my patients understand that that can't be achieved, but it gives me a sense of what they're looking for and whether or not their expectations are ideal. Social media images can be helpful, but sometimes hurtful if patients really feel that that is what they're striving for. And there are online uh, morphing uh, programs that patients um, can use. This is a URL for one that I that I use, which is which is pretty helpful. This is a standard X-ray. Um, standards of care states that body and facial feminization procedures don't require referral by mental health professionals. Interestingly, most insurance companies still require a letter, one letter from mental health professionals before moving forward. So there's a whole host of procedures that can be done, um, and I'm just going to um, talk about them in the in the following slide. So the upper third of the face. Um, involved. So the forehead area, hairline advancement, frontal sinus setback, forehead contouring, and then open brow lift. Okay. Those are kind of the, the big things that patients oftentimes want to move forward with. And so this involves making an incision that extends from your ear, um, goes across the hairline and then to your other ear. So it can be a pretty large incision. Um, and so the ideal candidate for hairline advancement, I've actually been doing fewer and fewer hairline advancements because of the scar burden uh, that's there. So a patient needs to really understand that you are trading off. So what you're doing is we're advancing your hair, but the trade-off is that you have a scar there. Most patients heal well, but there's a potential that you could scar badly. So you do have to keep that in mind. Understand the limitations. Not everyone can get a, um, a really far advancement. There's some unpredictability in that. And there's a contraindication if a patient had prior hair transplantation because it can cause those hair follicles to die. And not everyone's going to be a good candidate. So hair transplantation, so taking hair follicles and transplanting it to the area is a great option. Um, however, 
Um, the, the issue is that it does require um, a dedicated team and time, and it's typically not covered by um, insurance. But a good way to go that I tell many of my patients is to try hairline advancement, give it a year. If it's not where you want it to be, then you can always come back later um, and do hair transplants. But once again, typically not covered by insurance. So this patient would not be um, a good um, candidate uh, for hairline advancement uh, because she has thin hair, heavily recessed, this would be a good candidate uh, moving forward. Uh, once again, because she's got good quality hair um, and um, and she actually has a lot of mobility and movement with her scalp, which also makes her a good candidate. So I think the following, the following pictures are intraoperative pictures, so they will be graphic just to let you know. And then um, once I've gone through them, I'll, I'll let you know. So this is a marking um, of the hairline, um, as you can see here, extending down to the ear. And I do have to shave off a little of the hair, which I tell patients. So the distance between the brow and the hairline is about seven centimeters here. And so then I'm uh, incising with my scalpel, pulling down the skin. Once again, pretty graphic here. So this is a forehead. This is the orbit, so where the eye sits. I mark out the area of the orbit or the eye that I want to basically burr or contour. So the left side is the area that's been contoured. The right side has, has not been contoured. So for patients who have a very large um, area of bone and very minimal um, airspace, as you can see here. So this is about 10, 15% of patients. We can just get away with burring the forehead and getting a great um, uh, result, as you can see here before and after. But for some patients who have a very large airspace, very thin bone, this is probably about 80% of patients, then we have to um, do an osteotomy or cutting the bone. So this is coined by Dr. Ousterhout as a, as a type three osteotomy or a type three forehead. And so as you can see here, the frontal sinus area, which is a big airspace, um, and then the bone that's covering it, which is exposed. So I take a saw, cut that bone. This is the inside of the sinus, uh, remove the bone, recess the bone, and then put tiny little plates to hold it into place. I collect what's referred to as bone dust. So this is dust that flies in the air with a burring. And then um, use that to kind of spackle in the spaces there. Hairline advancement. So at the top of the screen, this is actually the hair. I've made, um, I kind of lined out the areas of the scalp that I have to, to incise or basically score in order to allow more forward motion. I use um, a bunch of sutures in order to do the brow lift. So the patient's on the right side of the screen, the brow lift's been done, the left side, it's still low, both sides have been elevated. Hairline advancement, I got about two centimeters, two centimeters of advancement, and then removing the uh, excess skin, and then suturing. And then what you can see here is that there's a shorter distance here between the hairline and the brow. So here you can see before and after. So once again, a shorter distance, the eyebrows elevated. I also did a rhinoplasty or a nose operation for this patient. Um, so it went, the distance here was about seven centimeters. Postoperatively, it's now five centimeters. And then here's another um, example of a patient who's had a hairline advancement. And you can see it really rounds out that area. Um, and then long-term um, examples of what it looks like. And then for the jaw, it's doing a genioplasty. So I'm done with the graphic um, uh, uh, photos just to let you know. So then the chin and the jaw are areas that are often addressed. So back to graphic photos. Here we go, just wanna let you know. So this is intraoperatively, this is the bone that's exposed just really quickly. And then I've outlined the where I wanna make my cuts. I use a saw to cut the chin. I take out a central aspect of bone, collapse the two pieces in, and that decreases the width of the chin. And then I use screws to hold it into place. And then I use a kind of a, a burr to sand the bone. And in some patients, we just uh, cut the lower border of the mandible and take out that bone. And then you end up with a, um, a more pointed feminine chin. Okay, done with the graphic pictures. And then you have all of these supportive um, compressive dressings in place. So chondrolaryngoplasty or trach shave, I make an incision that's high up in your neck. Um, here's a exposed Adam's apple. I remove the upper third of that cartilage. And then you can see the before and after. It can be a pretty dramatic difference. And there's some patients where this is the only procedure they want to move forward with before and after. And then a rhinoplasty is basically making the nose smaller, more pointed, more refined. And then a lip lift can be performed, and that shortens the distance between the nose and the lip to create a more a feminine contour. Cheek augmentation, typically you do fat transfers. So this is a, a patient who had fat transfers, uh, fat transfer that was done. Um, uh, and that was the only thing that she needed before and after. 
Non-surgical approaches can be entertained certainly as well. Um, and this is a patient who actually had Botox injected into her cheek muscles to decrease the width of her face. And that was the only thing that was done for her. Post-operative recovery, just like with vaginoplasty, does take time. And I tell most patients by three weeks, you can go back to work or school. Three months, you have 80% of results. And then one year, you have your full results. Um, and really just take it easy. Um, have good support around you. Be patient. Give it time. And I just wanted to show this patient for illustrative purposes. So this is a patient prior to transitioning. Um, this is um, this is her as she started her transitioning. This is when she presented to my clinic. Um, this is immediately after facial feminization surgery. This was about one week, three months, and she sent me a picture at a year and a half post-op. And then this is an example of how the upper um, aspect of the face can look. So you can see how just, in, this was the only part of her face we operated on. So you can see before and after just the shadowing is gone, the elevation of the brows, removing that, that bossing. It makes a huge difference for the face. And so I'm just gonna cycle through some pictures now before and after. These are all one year post-op and I've got a lot of pictures. So I'm gonna cycle very quickly. And once again, if you just look at the pictures before and after, it's the same patient, but it's a more feminine version of that particular patient. So she's wearing a hairpiece post-operatively here. And a lot of these are on my website, so you can also take a look as well. And for the sake of time, I'll just go pretty uh, quickly. One of my most recent patients, um, actually, and I've, I performed all aspects of gender surgery on, on her from, from head to toe, and she's, she's doing quite well. Um, and then what can happen is some degree of hair loss or what's referred to as alopecia, and this can be revised with uh, surgical tech, uh, procedures or hair transplants. Um, hair, tr hair loss can happen throughout the scalp in about 10% of patients, but over time it does grow back. So that's something that you do want to keep in mind. And then just really quickly, so a study that I did, and I'll just go through this, patients are happy. Um, so we found that postoperatively patients are quite happy um, and have uh, extremely high results of, um, of uh, resolution of dysphoria. Um, and the other thing that you want to keep in mind, and I tell this for all of my older patients above you know, 40 or so, there can be the potential of needing facelifts because you end up with loose skin. Um, and so I do believe that this is an aspect of facial feminization surgery that hopefully insurance companies will recognize. And I've written a couple papers uh, to that point. So hopefully that'll create a stronger case for those uh, for those cases. And so it's 440. I, I, if it's okay, if I could just have five more minutes, so maybe till 445 to just quickly go through breast segmentation and body contouring. These won't take terribly long, but I think they're important components. So for breast augmentation, only one mental health letter um, is needed. Um, feminizing hormones for at least one year is going to be important. Um, and I tell all patients that you do need a mammogram if you're greater than the age of 50 or you have a family history of breast cancer. And just like with all procedures, abstaining from smoking for one month. Um, I, all, I point out to all of my patients the asymmetries or the fact that, you know, breasts are not symmetrical. They're more like cousins rather than sisters. And the reason why I say that is because sometimes patients may look at their chest more after the operation and point out these discrepancies that they didn't notice beforehand. And then preoperative photos are very important. And patients want to look natural. That's the vast majority of what I hear from my patients. But there can be challenges, um, minimal skin, very tight um, pocket or uh, uh, tight uh, firm tissue that we're working with, lots of different options. But for me, I like to place the incision in what's referred to as the inframammary fold. So that's the the um, kind of the fold that's under the breast is about a one inch incision. I like to place it under the muscle because it looks more natural. And I like to use silicone round implants. Anatomic implants are not on the market anymore because they're associated actually with breast implant associated lymphoma, which we don't use. An example of a patient, lots of uh, my drawings as a plastic surgeon, we don't need to go through that. And then post-operatively, it's important to wear a sports bra for a month no strenuous activity for about a month. And most patients go back to work at one or uh, one to two weeks. So examples of results that can be obtained. So this is a patient pre-op at about three months, then one year. And you can see over time how things change. And these are all examples of patients who have had breast augmentation. And once again, we're going for natural. And this is what patients really want. And you can see that with breast augmentation, it does wonders in terms of, in terms of changing the entire look of the body. Even though we've only done breast augmentation, it makes the shoulder seem smaller. Um, and even the abdomen uh, looks smaller as well. And then it many times it does help 
to with the placement of the implant, it stretches the areola and makes it larger. I've seen that with many patients. Fat grafting can be done, but the results tend to be very modest. Um, and patients are happy. Once again, it's a study that I did, and you know, more than 92% of patients were happier after the operation than they were before. Biggest complications would be maybe unhappy with the size or wide cleavage. Um, and these can be corrected with revisions later down the line, but most patients are very happy. And then really quickly, the next few minutes, transfeminine body contouring. So more and more patients are actually uh, pursuing uh, body contouring because insurance is covering it um, you know, more and more and there's more of a demand. Why is there an increase um, demand? Well, societal influences, increasing insurance coverage. Uh, we've been seeing that. Um, and so it's important to understand kind of the differences between a masculine and feminine body. And I think a lot of patients and a lot of us can really identify that more than I think with, with the face. So a more feminine body is gonna have more fullness, lower down, a smaller waist. A masculine body tends to be a bit more straight or rectangular and can oftentimes have this divot or concavity um, in the lateral um, buttock um, area. The waist to hip ratio for a more feminine body is closer to 0 0.6. So once again, small waist, wider hips, and oftentimes it's dictated by the underlying bony structure. So body feminization, it's, it's typically achieved through fat transfer to the button hips is referred to as a Brazilian butt lift. Interestingly, it's neither Brazilian or butt lift, um, but it's still referred to that. So once again, it's fat transfer. Um, liposuction, implants, and then other skin excision procedures can be performed, but for the vast majority of patients, it's, it's fat transfer to button hips. What's really important, this is not one of my patients, but it's super important. So any of us who are providers working with the trans community, particularly trans women of color, cancel patients on the hazards of injectable uh, silicone. I, I remember I had a patient who said, oh, I'm going to go to you know, uh, to, to Mexico to get uh, silicone injected into my butt. And I showed her this picture and I said, this could happen if you do that. So do not do it. So um, there are a lot of unscrupulous individuals who will take advantage, unfortunately, of trans patients um, with silicone. It can lead to horrendous skin breakdown infections. It's super important to stop that. The goals for body feminization to accentuate the hourglass figure, wider hips, small waist, it's important to understand ethnic differences um, as well. So not every body type is should be um, uh, every body type should be treated um, individually. So I think more importantly, it's listening to your patients, and they oftentimes show you pictures of what they want. I think it's important to understand the limitations. Um, to look at the skin laxity. If they have a lot of loose skin, they might not be a good um, candidate. If they're super thin, they might not be a good candidate. And setting expectations. So someone who shows you a picture like this and says, hey, I want to have a body like this, then I tell them, you know, I can't achieve that. You're not going to be a good candidate. If someone shows me a picture like this and they're starting out like this, I tell them it's not going to be possible. So basically what it involves, so this is just kind of you know, um, equipment that I use in the operating room, but simply put, it's using liposuction to take out fat. The fat is collected in these large canisters. It's washed and then re-injected into the button hip. So this is a before and after that you see here. Patients, the big thing is that patients cannot sit on their butt for one, for one month post-op. So you need to be sure that you set things up so that you're not putting direct pressure on your butt because that can cause that fat to reabsorb. So want to keep that in mind. And then avoiding strenuous activities for six weeks. Final results can take six months or longer. There is some unpredictability and about 15 to 20% of patients need, may need repeat fat grafting. And these are kind of before and after results of various patients before and after. This is a larger volume um, fat transfer. And this is one of my largest volume fat transfers. It was about four liters. And she also had a tummy tuck at the same time. Um, and there are other options. I'm not going to touch upon those implants. I tip, I don't use them because again, have high rates of complications. And then just kind of final thoughts, as we all know, access to care. We really need to improve that with insurance coverage. Standardization of care is, is an important, I think, component. So increased training, you know, starting in medical school throughout residency, treatment of minors, we're seeing younger and younger patients, and then treatment of non-binary and gender non-conforming patients, and then requests for non-standard procedures, I've been seeing more and more. So these are things that we do want to optimize, um, have research on, and create appropriate um, standards um, as we as we move forward, as, as things evolve. Um, it's been a pleasure. Um, I do thank you.
Um, and once again, reach out to us anytime. This is our website, alignsurgical.com. Myself, Dr. Grijala, and then um, Dr. Uh, Dr. Rodriguez. Thank you so much, Dr. Satterway. You know, I, I have sat in these uh, back when we could meet in person and there were conferences across the country. I've sat in several of yours and you pack so much information into such a short period of time. I really appreciate you um, you being able to do that. So, um, I, you know, a couple of questions that have come around and, and in particular for us, because our focus does tend to be on youth, is this piece around uh, treatment of minors, which you talked about in the end there. And, you know, we have fought diligently to get insurances to cover for top surgery for trans mass folks under the age of 18. And, and you know, state of California now has rules around that, which is great. But how, what do we do about our trans girls that want to have have some level of facial feminization surgery under the age of 18. Yeah, that's a very important point, um, Kathy, that you're bringing up. So for facial feminization surgery, I think from a medical standpoint, we don't want to move forward until the face has reached full skeletal maturity. And for and for us um, as human beings, it's actually not until about the age of 18 or 19. So if I do have, and I've had patients who've come in under the age of 18 requesting facial feminization surgery and who would certainly benefit from it, but because I'm concerned about um, you know, the chance of needing revisions, I do wanna wait until after the age of 18 before moving forward. So from that standpoint, it's not necessarily the insurance aspect, it's more so the medical, um, aspect and the and the need to make sure that we minimize the chance of needing revisions or having um, complications or issues. Excellent. Yeah, it's it's such a hard piece for um, for individuals. You know, we talk in terms of can you imagine being, you know, a high school girl on campus and everybody reads you as male and 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 it's just it's hard. It's really hard. So um, just pointing out that we got a comment thanking you for showing examples of people of color uh, because we know that there are some differences there. And so that visibility becomes really important that is included. Um, and, and I know you talked some about this already, but can you share a little bit more about the statistics of people that are happy with their surgeries in, in the trans femme world, as well as like, what, what's some more that you can say about complications? Because I know that's a big thing on a lot of people's minds. Yeah, that's very important, right? And I think that, you know, for the longest time, you know, with, with gender affirming surgery, there there wasn't much much research at all, uh, particularly with patient reported outcomes. And, you know, I think now that there are more and more surgeons um, who are out there, and I think that there are more and more surgeons who are also in the academic realm, we are seeing this much needed research, um, not just from the technical aspect, but definitely looking at patient reported outcomes and including patients in many of these research projects, right? Because we really wanna get their perspective because that's what counts, right? It doesn't matter you know, what we're doing if we're not actually coming up with results that are benefiting um, the community, okay? So with that being said, so with each of the procedures, and I, and I touched upon this, but um, among all of the gender affirming procedures, I think vaginoplasty is really the hardest one in terms of the post-operative recovery, in terms of the timeline of achieving a level of satisfaction in terms of the potential complications. And so um, I've done research on my own patients for all of the procedures. So once again, facial feminization, vaginoplasty, breast segment, body contouring I haven't done, but breast segmentation I've done. And I found that for vaginoplasty, once again, when you pull patients at one year, they are happy. So more than 95% of patients are happy and satisfied and more than 71% of patients had a resolution of the dysphoria. But if you ask those same patients that, I don't know, one week post-op, if they were happy with the results, no, they wouldn't be because they're still in the midst of healing. Um, they're having changes in their hormonal levels, pain, discomfort. So at that point, no, they're not gonna be happy. So three months, I would say a good number of patients are happy, six months, majority, but it does take up a whole year. And that also goes with sexual function, as we know. And I think the thing is, it's because the vagina 
is is there's it's it's the the physical aspects of it it's the sexual aspects of it. there's so much that goes on um you know with the vaginoplasty um that a patient has to um fully um come to terms with before they can reach that that level of of satisfaction okay so if, if we go just you know strictly with the medical complications and medical issues so vaginoplasties, among all of the other procedures, have the highest rate of potential complications. And so I don't, I, I, I sometimes hate using the word complications because it makes it sound like this emergency. We need to rush you back to the operating room, you know, transfusions, lots of antibiotics. I think it's more so, I like to think of these, these complications as more so as a natural progression of the procedure. And this is across the board, not just with my, my patients, but among other surgeons who perform high volume gender affirming um, surgery and vaginoplasty. So wound breakdown, for example, this is just notorious for this area. This is you know, upwards of 20% of patients are gonna have some degree of wound breakdown. And I showed those pictures in my PowerPoint presentation um, to show what the timeline is, right? So I show this to my patients during consultation so they know that yes, your vagina might look like this at two weeks or one month with wound breakdown, this yellowish drainage, but then at six months, look at how beautiful it is, right? This is a natural process. So some patients or some individuals might think, oh, wound breakdown is a complication. Yes, in the surgical world, it can be, but once again, I think it's a natural progression. Granulation tissue I talked about as well can be deemed a complication, but once again, it's a natural thing that happens in the vast majority of patients and about 25% of patients, but big scary things, right? So having complete closure of your vagina, um, this happens in less than 1% of patients. Having lack of sensation, inability to orgasm, once again, very rare. Having what's called a rectovaginal fistula or a hole that connects the rectum to your vagina, that would be just horrible, but the, the chance of that happening is, is less than 0.4%. So these are very, very rare things that, um, that happen, but I think it's just kind of the natural progression. But for other procedures like facial feminization surgery, very few issues um, you know, that happen, very low chance of needing uh, reoperation. The biggest concerns that can happen are numbness, and I tell all of my patients this, your chin, your lip, your forehead are numb. And I think it can be very disconcerting to not be able to feel your lips and your chin. Um, so this is like when you go to the dentist and they and they numb you up and everything feels numb and it's hard to eat and you're eating. And then you look at yourself in the mirror and you see there's food that's just gone down your face and you didn't realize that. So for many patients, this can persist for a couple of weeks and that can be very difficult. And then for breast augmentation, once again, complications are very low as well. Very low chance of needing infection, very low chance of needing reoperation. And then for body contouring, patients are quite happy. The biggest concerns for body contouring are the potential for needing revisions later down the line because fat grafting can be unpredictable. For some patients, the fat stays in the body wonderfully. And for other patients, it goes away. And I don't know why. So I tell all patients that you might need a revision, um, you know, 15 to 20%. Um, of the of the time. Thank you. That that was great information for all of us to have. So we have a question that came across the stream. If you do not do a hairline advancement, but want the forehead and brow shaving, is the scarring still the same across the top of your head? Is the forehead skin peeled back still? Yeah, that's a wonderful question. And so since if I don't do the hairline advancement, um, I actually place the incision. Oh, I don't have any hair, but I actually place the incision on top of the head within the hair itself, which is actually advantageous because what happens is that incision is going to be camouflaged. So if you actually have the incision for the hairline advancement at the, at the front, that's going to be visible, right, at the level of the hairline. But if I'm not doing it, I place it on top of the head. I can peel back the skin, do everything that I need to do, close that incision. And then when your hair grows back, which does take a couple months, that hair will cover up that scar. So that's a huge advantage. When I first started doing um, facial feminization surgery about seven years ago, you know, a lot of my patients, I, I did hairline advancement, like the vast majority of my patients. Over the past couple of years, I've actually been decreasing that um, substantially. And, and that's because as I was briefly pointing out in my presentation, hairline advancement is just not as predictable um, as some of the other uh, procedures in facial feminization surgery. For some patients, I get great advancement. There's I don't. Some patients develop a bad scar. 
So I'm not a huge fan of it. Most of us as surgeons don't like to do things, and patients, of course, most of us don't want to do things where there can be that unpredictability. And the other thing is because hair transplants do produce such wonderful results. They don't, in years past, they used to look like, you know, those doll plugs, but they don't look like that anymore. They're like very, very natural. And so I do encourage patients to pursue that. Once again, the downside is that insurance doesn't cover it. There are a few providers, I believe, here in San Francisco that do work with insurance, though that that um, patients usually have to pursue the insurance kind of pathway themselves. But um, hopefully in the coming few years, it'll be more, more readily available from an insurance standpoint. And, you know, this this piece, staying on the insurance piece, um, because that's such an important factor of this, right? Accessibility is everything. And, you know, we know we're, we're located, you know, in San Diego. So Southern California is kind of our, our greater demographic, although we work with people all over the country. And, and we don't have the same accessibility in Southern California as folks in Northern California. California do. We don't have as many surgeons and choices and, and people with experience. Um, so as we talk about accessibility, and you brought up that you're seeing even some insurances starting to cover body contouring, what can you leave us with as the hope of what's happening within this, this level of medicine? What do you see coming in the future, in the, the near future, the far future, um, to just make it more equitable for folks to access this care? Yeah, that's a very good point. I think a lot of that weight falls on our patients, unfortunately, because I just thinking and, and just having to fight and move forward, because I remember years ago, your breast augmentation was not covered and facial feminization surgery was not covered. And so I would see patients in consultation and let them know that there's a low chance of getting coverage, but we have to just go through the motions. Let's have this consult, let's take pictures, let's get those letters from your mental health therapist and your primary care doctor, let's submit it to your insurance company. Your insurance company is gonna say no, I'm gonna appeal. I'm gonna have a peer-to-peer -peer discussion with the medical director. I am gonna fight for you. You know, We will bring in lawyers if we need to, and we have to keep fighting. And so many of these patients had to do that and they had to pave the way for other patients. And then finally, I think as insurance, as, as you know, many of our patients were pushing, were fighting, were appealing, they finally you know, realize, okay, we need to provide coverage. So they provide coverage for one patient, it opens the door for other patients moving forward. And I think that's gonna have to be the case as well with um, you know, body contouring that you know, as more patients, you know, as, as I see more patients, as I you know, put in uh, the request to move forward with the operation, yes, it might get denied, but the patient themselves will have to keep fighting and, and that is unfortunate it's definitely unfortunate but many of our insurance companies of the insurance companies um will really only listen to the patients uh more so than myself and they, they sometimes listen to me you know but you know but really it's the push um and it's the the yelling and the protesting and the fighting that our patients have to do uh, to open the door for uh, for other patients out there yeah. And and that's such a great point. You know, there are there are surgeons like yourself that will push and fight and be a voice. And there are other surgeons that don't. And and you know, this is kind of the core of our insurance work is really working with all patients of all ages just to be able to help them in that fight because it is so overwhelming. Um, while you're trying to do this, you know, it, helping to guide individuals with, okay, you know, here are the doctors that we can refer you to have a couple of consults, but helping them to understand as so many good mental health providers do as well, that this is a journey like you talked about. This is not, you don't pick up a phone and go get this surgery and it just happens and you walk away happy. We wished that was the way that it is, but it really isn't. So I wanna thank you so much for your time, Dr. Satterwhite. We really appreciate it. This information will be um, available on our YouTube channel. So you can feel free to share it out with your family and friends and other people. Um, giving those graphic warnings, because I know that was a little bit for some people. 
which we appreciate that you had those warnings. And uh, you can always reach out to Dr. Satterwhite's office, Align Surgical Associates, uh, to get your questions answered for consultations, any of that sort of stuff. So thank you again, Doctor. We really appreciate your time. And everybody, have a great rest of your weekend. Thank you. It was a pleasure and an honor. Take care, everyone.